we're going to allow an awkward uh, 30 seconds to a minute, approximately, let folks wander on in. We'll be getting started in just a minute. All right, good evening and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Kay from Greenlight, and we're excited to welcome you to our online event series, Squawk and Sports, hosted by Patrick Sauer and David J. Roth. For this installment, they'll be chatting with Howard Bryant about his new book, Ricky, The Life and Legend of an American Original. So you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I wanna say a huge thanks to Howard, Patrick, and David for making this happen, and all of you for showing up. We're grateful for your support. Now, just a couple of housekeeping things. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see or hear you. They can see that you're here, though, and there are a couple of different ways you can interact with the author and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like one speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. It's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and interact with fellow attendees. If you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the authors, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. And importantly, tonight's featured book is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person from 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. at both our Fulton Street and Flatbush Ab stores, where you can purchase Howard's book and many others on site. You can also order online at greenlightbookstore.com for quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the U.S. And the buy link will be in the chat. As thanks for attending tonight's virtual event, we are offering 10% off the featured book. Enter coupon code, all caps, all one. All right. So, uh, good. 10% um, off is a small price to pay for an extremely good book. This is this is the book that Howard wrote. Uh, it's Ricky. Patrick will be back along in a moment, I'm sure. Uh, so, I'm going to go ahead and put the cards on the table here. I know this might be uncomfortable for everybody. I thought this book was really good. I really enjoyed reading it. And <laughs> I don't ordinarily say stuff like that because, you know, it makes people feel uncomfortable or whatever. I would have read, and I think I would have absolutely been delighted to read a straightforward biography of Ricky Henderson because I enjoyed watching him play in my youth in a way that I haven't really enjoyed many players before since. This is not a straightforward biography of Ricky Henderson, Howard. You really go to great lengths to sort of like not just situate him as a player. And I mean, there is all the baseball stuff that's in there, but this is basically like the story of how a Ricky Henderson became possible as much as it is the story of how Ricky Henderson himself had his career. I'm wondering how you chose to take such a broad view at this, because I feel like there's, there's certainly enough there if you just wanted to write about you know, baseball, Billy Martin, George Steinbrenner, like all of the sort of like the big characters. Mm -hmm. And yet this book basically begins with the Great Migration and travels forward in time, covering more or less all of the different sort of social structures that made like Ricky Henderson, Ricky Henderson. Like, why get that big with it, do you think? Yeah, well, thank you. Well, and, and thank you, Greenlight, for having me. This is, it's always good to talk about uh, a project that I have been really passionate and uh excited about for a long time so to finally get it between two covers and to have people interested is fantastic so thank you very much um for having me i i think that for me where this approach came from 
really did come from Hank Aaron. It came from my last from my last biography. I did the last hero, a life of Henry Aaron, back in 2010, and in that book, we constantly were talking about how much talent was in Mobile. In Alabama, you had Satchel Paige and Double Duty Radcliffe and Willie McCovey. And then, of course, Ozzy Smith was from there. And so, and then on the white side of town, you had Milton, Frank Bowl, and all these guys making the big leagues. Uh, Double Duty, of course, was in the Negro Leagues. And so, this was one of the questions that people had constantly said about, about Mobile. And then we asked Henry about it, he would say, Oh, you know, something, it's just something in the water that we just create these players. And of course, in Oakland, it was the same thing. You think about all the talent that came out of Oakland, you know, Bill Russell and Frank Robinson and Veda Pinton and the, the, you know, the great stories of how the McClyman's high school baseball team in the 50s had Frank Robinson, Veda Pinson and Kurt Flood all in the same outfield. And so you've got this unbelievable amount of talent. And then when I started doing the research as well, you realize that on top of that, you also had the Pointer Sisters and all of this talent. And, and I was thinking, well, wait a minute, these people all came from somewhere. You know, what is, what is the origin? How did all of these great players, people end up in Oakland? And one of the things that I was really thinking about that made me really want to take it to, uh, you know, going back to the migration was the fact that when I was trying to do Henry's backstory, I really wanted to try to trace him all the way back to slavery. I wanted to see if I could get his entire line up to, to this day. The problem was, as I failed at this, the problem was because I believe the 1890 census doesn't exist. It burned in a fire in the Commerce Building, I think in the early 30s, in 1931, I think. And so you can go as far as 1890 to the census, then you get to 1880, 1870, but the 1890 census is gone. So you can't it's gone. There's, there's, there's no finding it unless you've got some family story or unless you've got some, some other sources of information, that link is broken. And so with this one, I was like, well, let's, let's talk about this. And I started to find out in, in doing the interviews, asking everybody, you know, where are your people from? Where are you guys come from? And it turns out that everybody was from, they were all from Arkansas, Louisiana, or Texas. And then in doing all the interviews, you're hearing the same stories. And then you start to look. And as much as you think about West Oakland with, with you know, Kurt Flood and, and, and Frank Robinson and Pinton and all those guys living over there, you also see that you had Russell live there and you also had Huey Newton living there, the founder of the Black Panthers. But then what really got me was that a lot of those guys were living within 10 miles of each other in Louisiana. So the entire migration is what created this legend of sports. And I was thinking about this from the standpoint of storytelling. We never talk about the migration in any real positive ways. Like most times when people talk about cities, they talk about how, well, you know, when the black people moved in, the city fell apart. And they talk about how the migration affected Chicago and Detroit in these different places. But they never really talk about the fact that that the root of the great migration was hope. It was to get away from where you were and to create something different, to create something better. And as one of the things I say in the, in the book is that the great migration was, it was the Ellis Island for black people. When you listen to the way the other ethnics in this country speak, they speak about coming to the new world with reverence, a new chance to have a new life. And I wanted to give that respect to these athletes I wanted to tell that story and to talk about why Oakland was so different and also being having covered Oakland and starting my career in Oakland covering the A's and also covering high schools and everything Oakland's different I mean yeah. they're all different I mean there's a different style there those kids down there when you cover the Oakland Athletic League they've got a swagger and a confidence about them that isn't just from any other city. It's a very unique Oakland thing. And I wanted to sort of dig into that as well. And, and, and to talk to Ricky and Gary Pettis and Dave Stewart about what was it like in the, in the, you know, in the home of the Black Panthers and what was it like seeing those all, you know, all of that sort of tumult and turmoil and inspiration all around you at once in this one city in a really small place. And I just thought that that was really, really interesting. And I thought it was really kind of cool. 
Okay, you have that map. There's a map. Actually, I can show you the map in the front of the book. And my oh, apologies. Printed for, map. My apologies for uh, whatever technical difficulties there were. I love that map, and I call it the dreaded map. Yes, it, the reason th I wanted to do that map. That was one of the first things I was thinking. I said this has to be the frontest piece of this book because nobody would believe just how much talent was from where. And I was trying to, when I was putting that map together, um, it was really, really funny because the rivalries got involved, like from the different parts of the city. Like Gary Pettis, for example, is actually from North Oakland. He grew up right next to Ricky, but he moved in the seventh grade to East Oakland down by Dave Stewart. And of course, <laughs> I had to ask him, I said, well, you can't be on the map twice. Where do you want to be? And at first he said North Oakland. And then when I was finalizing and fact checking the map, Dave Stewart sent me a text and said, Gary Pettis is from East Oakland. <laughs> <laughs> there's so much said, of that. It's so dense at the front of the book when you're laying all that out that like, I'll admit that there's a part of me that was like, is this going to be on the exam? Like, I don't remember where Lloyd Mosby went to high school. Like, I know he got bumped off the team or whatever. But it's in some ways like that density of information and then also the specificity of like the high schools and the rivalries and the parks where some guys would play at Bushrod Park and some guys wouldn't yep. or whatever, that all of that really like has the literary effect of sort of deepening it where you're like instantly you're thrown in at the deep end in this like crazy tumult of everybody knows everybody else, everybody's playing everybody else. Like it really like it works as a literary device as well as the fact that obviously like you're just packing that data in there as needed. Well, what's wild about it to me is that I don't know where you guys are from, but for me, if one person came anywhere close to D1, we were celebrating them. Dude, I could tell you everybody from my hometown <laughs> that's ever gone on to any. Jason Hayward was born there, and then his parents moved six months later, and I that's like I've dying out. Can you claim him still? Yeah, right? like it's so. <laughs> I can name all of mine. There's yeah. two in the entire can... state. I'm from Montana. Yeah, so my dad's got an edge We've got there. Dave McNally, who now and forever will be the only pitcher to hit a grand slam in the World Series. I just want to get that in there. And Jeff Ballard, and that's it. Um, <laughs> and Jeff Ballard, so yeah. Just having that much talent in that small of a space and the other thing is i'm working on a story uh coming to a defector near you at some point and it's about um it's very much about segregation segregation of little league in the 50s uh when you talk about hope you get a little you get a little farther along um and the, those guys in oakland they had freedom that i you know they would not have had just 10 years earlier or where they were from pre-migration and you could just you could just feel the rivalries and the friendships and the tension and yet everybody maybe not frank robinson who's a little older but everybody else was also like but it's also ricky yeah which is fascinating well, it, well exactly what's crazy about it is the fact that while i was doing the research they were telling me that you had ricky mosby pettis and dave stewart on the same little league team I mean, these guys weren't all just big leaguers. They're all all-stars. I was going to say, that's like the 87 <laughs> American League all-star team, give or take a couple <laughs> exactly. of years in a bunch of different directions. Right. The only thing that came close to that, there was one day when I was covering the A's, I was talking to Jason Giambi, and he was telling me that him, he and his brother, Nomar, Sean Green, and another guy, they were all in the same little league as well in Southern California. But Southern California is enormous. Oakland's right. got 300,000 people. Mm-hmm. So I just found this to be really fascinating and I wanted to really dig into it. And of course that Ricky wasn't even a starter. Ricky was the football kid. Nobody thought Ricky was the baseball guy. He was the one walking around with a football under his arm the whole time. And well, so it's also was... ama amazing that, I mean, he played for nine teams. I, I mean, I'm 51. So I pretty much, I remember Billy ball, maybe not his first couple of years. Um, I knew he had been on the Yankees. I kind of forgot how long that was, how much controversy went on. Is, he is the A's, like to me. Yeah. The Oakland kid is the A's. And then you added Dave Stewart, who's one of the coolest players ever. And I know he also played on other teams, but the fact that they got to do it at home, it just, uh, that thread through the whole book, which I think is what we're getting at, is uh, the Oakland tie to the whole book is fantastic. And then the other part of the book that I really liked, which also goes to all this, is this sort of art and science of base stealing. Yes. You will never look at Tom Treblehorn the same again. Yeah. <laughs> all these, it's that part of it was also, again, as somebody who has all these names bouncing around my head, like seeing which of the like 
otherwise completely identical crustoid old white guy managers of my youth like which of those guys actually did the work and were decent like human beings and player development guys and then which ones were just like weird salty drunks <laughs> was ricky, really interesting. ricky had both ricky had john kennedy in double a and he had tom treblehorn in a ball and Billy Martin, Billy Martin encompasses both sides of that. And Billy is all the above, <laughs> yeah. all the above. Yeah, and and it's funny that you bring that up about the the leaning on on Stu and leaning on Oakland. One of the things that really did change this book. One of the what I always try to talk about when you work on a book project project is there is an organic nature to what you're going to do. You have an idea of what you think it's going to be, but because of the length of time and the amount of research and all the different tributaries you can take, it's not going to end up the way you envisioned it in the proposal and the way you envisioned it in the outline because you just go other places. And then of course the pandemic hits. So my original thought for the book had been that I was gonna spend a lot of time going in and out of clubhouses, really talking to a lot of people. And I did, I talked to a couple hundred people, but I was nowhere near the number that I thought I was gonna talk to. I thought I was gonna talk to four or 500. And the pandemic changed all of that. So what it did was it forced me to write a way more personal book to really concentrate on the people who sort of knew Ricky, to concentrate on Stu, to concentrate on Eckersley, to concentrate on Mosby and Pettis and the folks that, that knew him really, really well. Um, and one of the other things that I really wanted to focus on too was this, this uniquely black story of the migration and how you get to a certain place. Like I really, one of my favorite things in the book was listening to the guy who discovered Ricky, Mr. Gwynn, JJ Gwynn, who was just, you know, a, a, a Berkeley police officer who had his own life in the major league or minor leagues, trying to get to the big leagues, didn't get there, ends up discovering Ricky, ends up discovering Claudel Washington. But what I really enjoyed about talking to him was both he and Lloyd Mosby talked about one of the biggest reasons for leaving the South was just the fact that their personalities were so irreverent that they were going to get killed there. Yeah. They weren't going to make it, that, that, that their families had to get them out of Arkansas, get them out of Texas, because they weren't going to survive by putting, you know, putting up with the actual, with the mores of the, you know, of the times. And so for for Mr. Gwynn to come to Oakland and to tell his story. That's the, one of my favorite things about books is you actually get to tell other people's stories as well and try to re remember to dig back in. And when I was working on the early parts of this cha of the chapters, I was like, well, don't forget, this is still a book about Ricky. You could write an entire book about <laughs> Oakland and the migration. Don't forget this is Ricky's book. Well, it's funny because in some ways, like in the same way that Ricky in his career, he spent four different stints with the A's, which I found actually really gratifying to be able to go back and look up because in my head, he's always with the A's, but I know that he also played for like a third of the rest of the league. It just seemed like he just kept finding his way back. But the well, hold, 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 I, want, I want to say something about that real quick. I highlighted something in his Hall of Fame speech where he says, I played for nine teams, which was great because I got to meet nine different fan bases. And I had never thought of that before. Like, well, yeah, that's actually, that's the flip side of the one jersey, you know. Uh, yeah real guys stay with one team. He was like, this is great. I got to meet guys over here and over here and over here. Also, uh, so like, many of them were like that late career kind of like he wasn't, I mean, he was good really like I, up until the last season, like he was still adding a lot of value, but there was also, you know, like him in an angels uniform. Like, I don't like remembering that. Like, I didn't that doesn't even look right to me at all. <laughs> but like, <laughs> what I was going to say though about the Oakland stuff is that I think that in the same way that like, yeah, obviously you could have written an Oakland book. I think you, you did in a lot of ways, write it, not just in terms of the beginning, in terms of like the, the scene and, and where all of these players and this culture sort of emerged from and the style emerged from, because the style is also like another important through line in the book that like the way that the rest of the country and the rest of baseball was constantly wrong footed by how different Ricky was, not just yeah. in terms of the <clears throat> football guy playing baseball approach, but just aesthetically was different. Yeah, a totally unique player in terms of how he went about his business. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think that the the thing about we talk about this about in baseball really more than any other sport is that basketball does the best job of it. Baseball does the worst job of it. Football somewhere in the middle. And that is the sport adapting to the people who play it. 
baseball does not adapt to the people who play it. You to adapt to, to it. its detriment. To yeah. its detriment, in my in my opinion, yes. Remember, let's not forget, people lost their minds when Ken Griffey Jr. had his hat on backwards for yeah. batting practice. They it's just the most lo- elementary shit in the world. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's partially and, how you end up with eight percent uh, black players in, in, a, in a TV age where people want to show. And, and and that was the point that I was trying to make early is that that the the game is was still even in the seventies. It was a TV sport that was still dominated by newspaper people. I mean, let's face it: when Ricky was a was a rookie, Dick Young and Red Smith were still writing. Yeah. I mean, so it's like a long time ago when these guys, you know, the, the, these guys started their careers giving their stories to the Western Union man, and 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 now it's a it's not a newspaper game anymore, and it's a TV game. And and here's a guy who plays with an enormous amount of style. He's an, he's got an incredible amount of flair. And baseball hates that. You do not draw attention to yourself as a baseball player. Basketball, basketball used to be a Jewish game, right? It used to be a completely Midwestern game. And now it's, then it became a, a city game. Then they had to begrudgingly acknowledge the fact that the ABA style is a black game. And now you've got to sort of allow that to become part of your game. And now it's a Euro, it's an American European game as well. Basketball will adapt. Now they all Euro step and they all flop and they all do yeah. what the basketball players do over there. But baseball expects you once you step into that clubhouse, you are going to play the game the way white men played it in a segregated era. That they're not friendly to each other. There's no fraternization. They'll throw the ball at and hit you in the back if you style a home run or even if you hit a home run, they hit the next guy. All of those old school styles come with you when you come to the major leagues. And what's really interesting about it is nobody else in the world plays baseball that way. You watch the Korean baseball league. They flip the bat. They do what they want. Go watch the Caribbean World Series. You know, go watch winter baseball. They yeah. do the same thing. Negro League baseball didn't have that sort of nasty edge that the white players had from the late 1800s, early 1900s. But they all expect you to play that way once you get to the big leagues. And Ricky wasn't like that. There's so much of that tension in the story of just how the beginning of the book, the first stint with the A's, where Ricky is is sort of I mean, very instantly is an impact player. Not very instantly. He's immediately an impact player in the minors. They slow roll him through the minors. He gets to the majors, and he's fighting and clawing to get the permanent green light to steal bases that you know would later be not necessarily an outlier thing. But at the time, it was like, the power struggle, especially given that you made clear that Billy Martin understood in a way that like, you know, whatever, to his credit. And the portrait of Billy Martin in this book is pr- for something that is like as a supporting character is like very deeply drawn. That like you see a guy who is insecure and also uh, very confident. You see a guy who is in some ways very loving and in other ways just an idiot bigot who's completely <laughs> out of control all the time. Hated Latin players. Hated Latin Hated players. Them. And then the experience, <laughs> Shooty Babbitt. Again, this is where it really oh, shows you talk to a couple Babbitt. of hundred guys is that this is a dude that had like 200 major league plate appearances <laughs> who was bullied terribly by Martin, a black player from Oakland. From that Berkeley, from Billy's hometown. Yeah, like who was also an undersized guy. Like it should have worked. But that power struggle, what I was going to say about this instead of just remembering guys at speed, is that, that it's clear that Martin understands that he has on his hands something like the future of modern baseball. That like this is a guy who, even if he's not hitting homers yet, that Henderson is always on base. He can always, you know, generate those those Ricky runs with like a walk, a steal, another steal, and scoring out a pop fly. Like that him fighting that or trying to find some way that he can be in control of the future, even though the future is already outpacing any imagination that he could have is like, it just repeats throughout the book that there's this, like, that Ricky is, it seems like a little bit ahead and that the game is constantly trying to get him to slow down. Yeah, when you think about your own life, and I think about, and when I was writing this, I was thinking about it. How many bosses have you had that just said, go do what you do best? I mean, normally speaking, when you have a job, they want you to do the job the way they want the job done. Very few places, the greatest jobs in the world come from finally having that boss who gets me. Just go do what you do. We hired you because you're good. Go be good. And in Ricky's case, and this happened throughout his career, everybody was so fixated on what it looked like, 
on how he did what he did and whether or not what he did was respectful or disrespectful or how he went about his business or whether or not he was stretching with gusto or not or whatever you want to except billy billy saw what ricky could do and said go do it because you're going to help us win ball games and in billy's case 100 percent right billy as a manager he only focused on the guys who were going to help him win. That's really kind of a shitty thing to be in, in some ways. That the you know the the root you know the the uh, it's like Joe Morgan used to say, baseball is only fun when you're good at it. The role players need the manager more than anybody. The good players go out and they and they go play, but that's not Billy. Billy was going to play favorites with the guys who were going to keep him employed. And when he saw Ricky, he noticed something immediately because that's how Billy played the game, that we are going to pressure the opposition every single step of the way. It would be amazing to watch Billy today with this station-to-station -station launch angle. We are not taking any chances, risk-averse baseball that they play today. Billy would quit. I don't want to do this. This is not how the game is played. And yeah, you're right. It, it, at an immediate point, it was very, very clear what he could do and the speed that he brought to the game and the way that one of the biggest whiffs of this book you know i really wanted to i really wanted to just do a sort of chapter on base stealing on just the history of base stealing and i just thought it got a little bit too esoteric and get once again if i'm doing great migration and then i'm going to do the history of base stealing yeah. i'm getting away from my subject yeah but these were the one, things maybe not right? both you know but these were the things where it was like why when you saw him was he so electric? There are certain, I think about it like when I, when I think about music, when you think about your favorite songs, there are certain songs that are so good and so unique, you remember exactly where you were the first time you heard them. And with Ricky, it was so clear that what he was doing was so far ahead of his time because he understood certain things that most guys just don't get that early. They don't, you know, they're not working the count that early. They're hacking, they're up there swinging. And Ricky's got the high on base early. He's got world-class speed. He, in, in the, and the power actually came last. And so it's a really interesting thing when you're watching him because so much throughout his career, and, so, and, and race has a lot to do with this, where you're watching this guy and here they are, the you know the flashy black guy, and he's you know not concentrating on and all the stereotypes that come with it, and so you're concentrating so much more on what, on how he's doing it instead of what he's doing, which is always a which is always insane to me because across any sport, if there were guys who were only out for uh, swag swagger without talent or whatever you want to call it. You know you're the Nick Youngs of the world. They're not good, <laughs> and they get exposed <laughs> early. Yeah, yeah. The, the good, the good player, like all these guys. Well, he he could have been. What exactly was he not doing? I've never quite understood. Um, not just Ricky Henderson. You know, any of them. I I saw a lot of Iverson comparisons in the way they comported themselves and the way they yep. came up. Obviously, off the field, off the court, Iverson had a much, um, you know, dark. His, his story is much darker uh, in a lot of ways. But that idea that they will bend the game to their will, um, I saw a lot of the similarities. And what also you, what goes along with that is that your book really, which something I think we probably understood on a surface level, but uh, how smart and intelligent uh, Ricky Henderson's base stealing career was. Like this was not, hey, he's a fast guy who knows how to run, you know, or whatever. It's all flash, blah blah blah. Just the watching, knowing when to jump, like looking at the picture, like the, there was so much more to that than I, I guess I realized because, like I've said, I don't know if I ever read anything about base stealing before, um, and that's you know, and because he had his malapropisms and you yeah. know whatever for his Ricky being Ricky, which we'll get to in a minute, which is also overblown, but it just it, this notion, which I hope is dying down to some degree, but it's always there that. Um, players with superhuman athleticism don't you know that's that's just what they get by on and it's yeah. like no this guy was the smartest base stealer you know probably ever and it, it, that really comes through in the book which i'm sure he appreciates if he read it <laughs> <laughs> that we'll find out um yeah and i think the other thing with him what i was really trying to get at was there are there are like really 
three things that I thought were really important. Obviously, we talked about my, the migration. That was that was one of the things that was that was a big deal. The other thing that was really important to me was that this is a book about money. I mean, like for me, like the way I think about the sports century, the 20th century, which is the rise of sports as an industry, is it really is three waves. And I've always viewed it as three waves. The first wave is the immigration wave, where the kids that came to the new world, uh, the, the parents didn't speak English. The kids learned how to become American largely through sports, whether you're it's the Germans or the Poles or the Italians or the Irish. It's all boxing and baseball. And on so much of it, they learned to become American through that. And that is the start of this second generation of, of European immigrants. The second wave is the integration wave which is where now black people are being centered as part of the culture and they're not in the background. The Jackie Robinsons is that people talk about baseball and why is baseball so special? Baseball is the first major American institution to integrate. It integrates before schools, it integrates before the military, it integrates before corporate America, it integrates before everybody. And then of course, the third one is the money era, the economics, the free agent era, where now we're looking at these players and whereas they used to make three or four or five times more than what the average American made, now they're making 50 times what they're making and they're making 100 times what people are making. And when I was going through the day by days looking at you know, Len Barker writing a letter to the fans in Cleveland apologizing because he got a $900,000 contract and, and, and here's Russell Westbrook opting in for $47.1 million. I mean, it's just a different time. And, and the thing to remember is is that during Ricky's time, Ricky's first five years in the league, we're not even 10 years into free agency. So this is a brand new thing. And there are so many times during the research where you saw the columnists talking about how baseball's not a sport. I mean, I'm sorry, it's not a business, it's a sport. It's not a business. And Ricky is the exact opposite of that. Ricky's attitude from day one is pay me. Pay me what I'm worth. And that runs exactly in line with the fact that baseball was constantly in labor battles. And so he's not popular. He's not a guy. You know, um, the United States is very, very clearly obsessed and in love with money, except when these ballplayers are asking for their money. Mm -hmm. And so it was really sort of fascinating how much he was willing to advocate for himself from day one. And, and what that did was it created not just a an, an adversarial sort of acrimony that you had with the public in some ways, but it also created a challenge for him. I am completely convinced of my ability and I'm also really willing to back it up. And that was him saying that he viewed himself in that sort of Muhammad Ali uh, ethos where it's not bragging if you can do it. And that's really, that runs again, like through all, cause money, and again, like to your credit, it's in there through, cause this is a guy, he played long enough to have many different contract battles, many different, I mean, starting, you know, with like, as you said, like one of the first, you know, whatever few dozen guys to go through salary arbitration, probably yep. that the, the competitiveness that he had that is sort of present in all of it. I mean, certainly it's like why he was good at baseball, much more than like any sort of love for baseball or its lore or whatever it's just like this sort of like i don't think that there's any catcher that can throw me out i don't think that yeah. there's any pitcher that can pick me off i don't think there's anybody that can get me out like which is not an unusual thing for an elite athlete to have but to see the way that that sort of spills over not just into terms of of him trying to get the money that he felt he deserved but then like in every other aspect of this that there is just like a competitiveness that seems different to me than like, you know, you hear stories about like, you, if you play ping pong with Aaron Rodgers, he has to beat you. And like, that's in here too, that, you know, yep. like Ricky had to win. That's common to me. Like the, the part of it that was that, that I was struck by is the sense that it's like the central ethical, like at the very core of his being is that he's not going to be denied the shit that, that he can get that he, you know, like whatever it is that he can earn he wants all of it well that's right and and there's one other piece to that too which i found fascinating and it was if we're talking about rafa nadal nobody's shocked 
watch the way he plays. If we're talking about Derek Jeter, nobody's shocked. If we're talking about Michael Jordan, nobody's shocked. Michael Jordan is the greatest shark who ever put on a pair of shorts. But Ricky had this reputation of a guy who didn't want to play. Yeah, that part of it was so strange to me because that, that was really ringing bells when you get to the Yankee part of his career where they're talking about he's taking too many day games off after night games and all of this. And that made me realize that, like, since all of my sports news came from Sports Illustrated, at the time I didn't know those guys were also New York guys, and I hated the Yankees and always have. <laughs> yeah. I probably bought into When I was 13, I'm probably like, I don't know, Ricky dogs it all the time because that's what I've been told. And obviously there's, you know, all kinds of things that go into it that are unfair to him. Um, but I do think it – is it the Yankees years and the Yankees columnists that really set the template? I mean, he would have gotten shit from some people for being flashy and et cetera, but yeah, ha had he stayed in third. Oakland, would he have ever had that, the amount of baggage they put to, on To him? that degree, absolutely not. To that degree, absolutely not. New York is, New York changed his entire, um, his entire arc. And, and it's true. And, you know, I was talking about the three things. It was the migration. It was also this, this, economic era but the third thing also was what came with this era was also that these players for the first time you went to the highest bidder you weren't homegrown anymore and now you had to deal with these black players who were now the face of your franchise but you didn't grow up with them you didn't they weren't part of the organization they were treated as mercenaries and they now they are the ones you know does the organization want to promote them you have to promote them now because you're paying them all this money. They are the face of your franchise, whether you want them to be or not. So and they're all always, super, and they're almost all superstars too. And that. they're all superstars as well. But they're you've got this balance. Yeah. That's that's right. You've got the Eddie, you know, Eddie Matthews and Henry Aaron. That's fine because they're both homegrown. And also you still have Eddie Matthews, who was Eddie Matthews, the guy who's on the first, you know, the first guy in the cover of Sports Illustrated. You know, you've got Thurman Munson, his team homegrown so you still have that white player as the face of the franchise you've got Carl Yastrzemski coming after Ted Williams still the white guy who's the face of the franchise and in New York you have that but then you got Reggie and Reggie sort of changes the balance and then you pay Winfield but thank goodness they had Mattingly and so the, the, the racial undertones of who is the face of the team, whose team is it, all of those things, you know, really, really did poison the relationships. And now you've got, here comes flashy Ricky Henderson. And those guys, talent-wise, they were monsters. But the volatility around them was so difficult. Even Mattingly, you know, people don't realize this. Because George Steinbrenner had been rehabilitated by the, by the Jeter Yankees and the Tory Yankees. George Steinbrenner of the 80s is the true George Steinbrenner. And was a maniac. I mean, and the like, guy was a maniac. It's I've dined out on this talking to younger coworkers about it too, because they I mean the one that they remember is kind of the like old guy slumped over in a box, or Larry David's voice on Seinfeld. I mean, if that. But or like, the yeah, curmudgeonly the, guy who still, you know, in a world of greedy billionaires, he was the one who put his money back into his team because he may have been a little crazy, but he wanted to win. George wanted to win for the fans and he represented the fans. And I'm like, this is not the George that was George when he was younger. I yeah, Mattingly, come off, Mattingly comes off actually pretty well uh, being in Ricky's corner against uh, a lot of that. And it was funny talking. Yeah, and it was funny doing all the interviews. Ricky talked about Donnie more than anybody, his favorite player, favorite teammate. And hmm. other than, of course, when he came back to Oakland, he had Dave Stewart because those two grew up together. But he didn't talk. I mean, he, Willie Randolph and Winfield and, you know, Baylor and the rest of them, that was fine. But it was Mattingly who was his guy. There's one bit that I want to talk about that just to jump off the, um, the way that Ricky was handled by the New York press. Like you mentioned that even though he came in as basically like really one of the most dominant players in the game that the initial point of comparison there was, was Mickey Rivers yeah. who's a good player but and a guy that was known and again certainly the way that again growing up when I grew up what I knew about Mickey Rivers beyond that he had good numbers on the back of his baseball cards was that he said a lot of silly things that got reported yeah. in like ways that I think we would now recognize as being pretty squeaky like borderline <laughs> racist stuff and you use the word minstrelry to talk about how like the box into which like sort of Ricky was was put and he was a different sort of dude 
Like he has always had a particular way of talking, a particular way of styling that would look different to, you know, whatever, like a 65 year old white guy in 1985, New York city that was writing for the daily news or the post or whatever. But I, I wanted to, and it's better if you do it than me filibuster on it, but how do you feel like the way, like the structural ways that baseball discourse worked? How do you think that that concealed important things about Ricky Henderson? Like what oh, did really we important. not know because of that? Yeah, well, I mean, the biggest thing is when who gets to tell your story? And that is really sort of central. And as much as we talk about race and ethnicity and diversity and the rest of it, the press box is white. That press box, all those press boxes, especially back then, they were writing about black athletes. There were very few. I think Ricky only had early in his career. I think he only had one or two. I think he had one beat writer who was black writing about him. It was Claire Smith. And that was in the, in, in, and I don't think the A's had a, of course, Wiley was a columnist. I don't know if he was an A's beat writer at first. He was a columnist. So in terms of the number of beat writers who actually covered Ricky that looked like him, not very many, hardly any. I covered him in 98, his, his last stint in Oakland, the fourth trip. And so, yeah, that sort of, you know, who gets to determine how you're, you know, how you're portrayed to the public, huge, enormous amount of power. And in Ricky's case, people just looked at him like he was, and I think one of the reasons why you looked at him like he was Mickey Rivers is because baseball at that time, if you were gonna get paid big money, and it's pretty much true today as well, you gotta hit the ball over the fence. And that's how people view it. And that's how they viewed it then. That's how people view it now. I mean, it's the, the big guys get the big money. And here's Ricky getting an $8.6 million contract and back then, he's not really seen as a power hitter, but Billy knows what he can do. And so at that time, the only comp would be another sort of jitterbug, sort right. of waterbug leadoff fast. type guy that's not a real threat. Ricky is an entirely different beast. But there's and also that, you know, you could have compared him to Tim Raines had you wanted to. But Tim Raines didn't, what they, I, the part that I thought about was diminishing about the Rivers bit was in the same sense that this is like, yeah, he's a, clown. a baseball player, but he's also black comic relief. That's right. And Ricky's story. not a joker. The yeah. funniest thing about dealing with Ricky is that the Ricky stories are, are funnier than dealing with Ricky. Ricky's a serious guy. I mean, Ricky's hilarious. You sit down with Ricky. When I got him, he was great because he was in a good mood and was just telling hilarious stories. But Ricky is not a joker. Ricky is not a let's play two guy. Ricky goes to the ballpark to beat you. And when the game is over, Ricky goes home. So he's not Cal Ripken, and he's not Brooks Robinson, and he's not Tony Gwynn. He's not that guy. And he's certainly not Reggie, which is what the other thing that New York was expecting from a black player, that the guy was going to be out at the, you know, at Studio 54, and he was going to be everywhere, and he's going to be on page six. It's not Ricky at all. You know, Ricky at, his, at heart is really sort of a, he's a quiet country guy and wants to be left alone. And his attitude had always been, well, you know, once the game is over, I gave you what I owe you. And that just didn't create the type of warmth that people thought they were going to get from him. One of the things I wanted to do in this book is to talk about a guy who really was one of the most disliked players in baseball for much of his career. And then by the end, people began to view him the same way they view sort of Satchel Paige and Yogi Berra, this guy who was going to play forever, who was this real character, and that people love to tell these third person stories. But when he was building his monument, a lot of acrimony, a lot of trouble in terms of how they viewed him and how he viewed and how he viewed the press and the public in a lot of ways. And you have a it's it's you the, there's a lot of nuance in explaining the sort of Ricky being Ricky in which some of that some of the stories are true. Uh, some of the character he played into a lot of it's overblown. And then you point out some black players roll their eyes at some of the ways the stories are being told. Um, again, they just, it's like, uh, he couldn't just be a somewhat eccentric, somewhat aloof genius on the diamond. It had to be, because I think going back to the, this New York years that got stamped him with this jaking it, whatever, you know, word had to be made up. <laughs> the uh, great words of yeah. baseball history. So, you know, they just, a lot of it just seemed to be, we have to undermine his intelligence, you know, talk about Mickey, same thing with, you know, the Mickey Rivers comparison. But at the end, 
Oh, you know, like explain the third person. A lot of it was him actually just pumping himself up. Like, yeah, he's talking to himself. David Cohn told me this hilarious story when he's watching Ricky and Ricky's talking and he's and Cohn is about to, you know, going, is he talking to me? And he's like pitching. He's on the mound. And he's like, why is because he realized that Ricky was simply trying to gear himself up for the at bat, which really didn't go well because, you know, he hit like 140 against David Cohn for his <laughs> career. But it, it, it was it, it was he's a different guy. He's a really different sort of character. But the thing about Ricky is that he is extremely funny. And like the stories are you know, people ask me like, OK, so you went into this to do a lot of myth busting. I'm like, no, I decided to just let the history be the history, like let the legend and the and the facts, let them blend together because the stories themselves sort of make up who he is. It didn't really make a difference if the stories were true or not. To the black players, it absolutely made a difference because they're like, listen, we're trying to be taken seriously here. We want to get jobs in this business. We want to be seen as equals. This shit isn't helping us. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's funny because you have like the frostbite in August story is true. And on yep. all the rude, I used to play a guy with a helmet is not true. Is not true. But the and framing both, the check on the wall funny. is true. Yeah. They're both funny stories. Yeah. But they also, if you take them together, like if, if you build on those, even the ones that aren't true, it's like, oh, this guy is uh, out to lunch all the time. It's like, not no, that's not the case at all. He's just, he's a little aloof and a bizarre, as you point out, he's kind of bizarre. Um, and that's what makes him interesting. <laughs> yeah. What's fascinating to me about all of this is that this guy absolutely obliterated the record book. I mean, that is the thing. And that you come out of here in 1988, 89, 89, when he gets traded back to Oakland, he's got the reputation as a loser. I mean, he destroyed the Yankee record book. I mean, that he, he broke the all-time Yankee stolen, in, you know, single season stolen base record three out of the four years, four and a half years he was there. He broke all these big league records before he was eligible for free agents. You know, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's crazy. It's, it's, it's amazing what he, what he did. But the bottom line was because of his stay in New York and because of the injuries and because of the fighting with, um, you know, with Lou Pinella and fighting, you know, about his, you know, him taking care of his body. It's fascinating that today they actually talk about load management for baseball players when back then, if you were an outfielder, you were expected to play 150, 150 plus games. You know, Willie Mays played 150 games, 13 straight years in the polo grounds where it's 502 to dead center. Right. I was going to say, and, <laughs> extra couple miles of running a year. Exactly. You added all and that. then in Candlestick, which was not an easy place to play. And so you're looking at Ricky. Ricky averaged 135 games. People are saying he doesn't want to play. They're saying he's jaking it. They're saying he's not serious. And yet the amount of numbers that he, that he you know, compiled, it makes you wonder instead how much better would Hank Aaron or Willie Mays or those guys have been with a little bit of rest. Or Mike so, Trout, you point out Mike Trout. Yeah. And Trout, what's happening Trout, now. That's right. That's right. And so these guys are, you know, once again, Ricky couldn't be controlled. He's his own unique, different guy. And that's sort of what happens with these, with these sort of great, great, legendary genius level players. Whether you're talking about Hank Aaron or, or Michael Jordan or Ricky or whomever, eventually what you find is that they were ahead of their time that they were so far beyond what the norms of the game were at the time they were playing, that they did stand out as completely unique. And in, and in Ricky's case, the, the space in which he did things, you're never gonna see it again. Like people say, oh, what's Ricky's legacy? And sometimes I say, I don't know if Ricky has a legacy. I used to think that he did because there was the Vince Coleman's and you know, the Cesar, well, Cedeno came before him, but you know, the the other base dealers, the Kenny Loftons and the other guys yeah. who stole bases. But today, because of the way they play the game, there's not going to be another Rick. Ricky's a unicorn. I mean, when you look at his numbers, just to be very quick on this, as I, I've always I've told this story over and over again, from two, you know, 1979, Ricky's first at bat, 2003, uh, his last at bat. By the end of the 2001 season, when he joins the Red Sox, from 1979 to 2001, he stole more bases than the Red Sox. <laughs> he stole more bases than the whole team over a 20-year period. I mean, you just can't make... That's Babe Ruth stuff. You can't make that up. And so I just found him to be in just an incredibly compelling character. I'm going to ask one last question because I know we're, we're running out of time. Um, and this is sort of jumping off from the book. It's not anything in it. Uh, the book is really great. I just This is different. Go back to the Oakland thing briefly. There's... 
because we've talked a lot about how there isn't like room for that type of player in baseball at this point, just given the way that baseball has kind of through its efficiency fetish through a bunch of different sort of, you know, reasons, most of which have to do with business sort of narrowed itself down into a, a sort of more shelf stable, but also a little bit more boring product. If you, there's not a non-obnoxious way to say it. So I'll say it that like, like the way that there's like terroir with wines, you know, that like you get something from a place and it's like an expression of that soil, right? Like it only, a grape that grows there is only going to taste the way that it tastes if it comes from this part of Italy or this part of France or this part of California, whatever. The idea that there was this group of like Oakland players over the course of a few generations that really were different, really did sort of move the game forward. Do you sense that we have seen the last of that domestically? I mean, I feel like we're going to get, we already have seen, you know, players from the Dominican, players from Japan and Korea that who are like different enough and the game is sort of grudgingly changing there. But do you feel like that there is a possibility for that sort of flourishing in the way that that baseball works in 2022? Well, you need you certainly need a course correction at some point, some part of course correction, because the way that it's being played right now, the answer is no. And there are so many reasons for that. I, I think that the biggest issue that we have with baseball, anytime a sport is trying to convince you that it's interesting, has got major, major problems. Yeah. <laughs> and baseball goes out of its way to try to tell you, we're not boring. We're, you know, we're exciting. Let the kids play. They keep trying like, to tell you that my it's baseball's more... not boring t-shirt is raising questions <laughs> answered by my t-shirt. Exactly. They're trying to tell you that this is actually more fun than you think. It's better than you think it is, right? It's good <laughs> for you. And so to me, what you need to do in the sport somehow some way and you actually have it in front of you i mean how can you not find trout and otani compelling for what they're doing i was talking to cc sabathia uh, a few weeks ago and he's like he's the greatest player of all time i'm like he goes yes he, Shohei otani is the greatest player of all time and i was like cc he's like no it's true he goes look he's doing shit at the big league level that we did as eighth graders yeah <laughs> he's doing it right now name me another guy who can do what he's doing and i was like okay case closed <laughs> That's like those, what they call like the little league games where he like, yeah, yep. pitches seven innings, hits a home run and drives in three <laughs> runs or something. You're like, sure, I guess people can do that now. Yeah, exactly. And so I just look at, you know, people ask me about, you know, are we going to see something like this again? I'm like, you look at Ricky and I just put it this way. 3,000 hits, 3,000 runs, I'm sorry, 2,000 runs, 2,000 walks, 1,400 stolen bases. You're not getting that again. Yeah. Never going to see that again. Well, and then, I mean... The stolen base thing is funny because he became a sabermetric hero, except for the stolen bases. Which That's is right. Was part of his game. That's like, oh, so we're gonna take the part where he walked a lot. That was neat, and it's yes. Yeah, <laughs> That's fun. That's uh, fun. We're well, I said to Billy Bean, I said, Billy, well, you know, what kind of guy is Ricky today? And he said, Ricky is Mike Trout today. Ricky is. We were gonna we're gonna swap. The, st the steals for the power. We're going to emphasize his power. He's probably more of a three hitter than a leadoff guy. He doesn't have Trout's power, but he's got plenty enough power. And I'm like, yeah, but that's not Ricky. Right. Well, they just wouldn't chance giving away outs like that. Well, that's exactly. Thing, and his even point, like, he's Billy's a very point, efficient base dealer, but like, you know, even then you get caught 20 odd times a year. That's like. Well, Rick, you know, the, you know, I talked to Mike Rizzo about this when I was down in West Palm before the pump, before the pandemic, he said, look, we. In order for you to steal, you got to get in at eighty-five percent. I'm like eighty-five. Yeah, it's like eighty-five. You know, and in the in the seventies when we were coming up, seventies, eighties, nineties, seventy-five percent was good because the league average was around sixty-eight percent. So if you were above that, you were great. But now they wanted eighty-five percent, and so that being the case. Ricky still gets to steal because Ricky was stealing at an 85, 86% clip in the 80s, even though he had massive numbers of attempts. But if that's the way you're looking, then it's a risk averse game instead of a risk reward game. Yeah. And that's one of the, that's an interesting way to talk about it too, because there's so much when people talk about the way that 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 sort of added data or that like more metrics driven approach like sort of warps the shape of the game. It's usually like it's stuff that you see because it's different. You know, that like you see all these strikeouts, you see the shift, you know, whatever stuff that like when you're watching a baseball game, the shape of the game is different for that. But what yeah. you're talking about is basically the absence of this incredibly fun, longstanding aspect of the game that just has been deemed like too risky. Unacceptable. I said to Ricky, I, Ricky and I were talking about this a couple of years ago, and he said, well, what makes you think the other two guys are going to get me in? Why are you why are you so focused on my ability to get second? 
when the two guys behind me I said, you really think we're going to string three hits in a row to get me in or two hits in a row to get me in? I got a better chance of getting to second. Yeah. So much of that, especially in the early A's days, is like he's stealing all these runs on like teams that were mostly bad. Yeah. And the concern that like everybody seemed to have was like how this would impact Dwayne Murphy's feelings or whatever. <laughs> and it's kind of just like it feels really strange in retrospect when you look at it. But I mean, all uh, of it kind of does because it's sort of antique baseball. Cool book, though. We will, really, we'll, really enjoyed this book. Dude. We'll skip Thank you. We'll skip the uh, clip because we're at the, at the coming to the end. You can look up all the Ricky highlights on YouTube. I do have one question I want to ask to wrap up. Yes, sir. Um, you say in the uh, the book, part of the reason you wrote the book is because you talked to Ricky's wife, who is also his uh, high school sweetheart. I mean, they've been oh, together yeah. for, mm -hmm. for a long, long time. Um, because she was worried a little bit about his legacy. Um, and I'm just curious, he wrote a book. I didn't know that. I It, it must not be in the annals of great sports memoirs. I'm not going to, I don't know. I haven't read it. But... Um, did it surprise you that she is worried about it, which means maybe he's a little worried about his legacy? Like, I just, I guess time goes on, people get forgotten, but it's, uh, this is the definitive biography. And to me, he just looms so large a figure in the sport, but I guess, I guess, I guess people worry about that. Well, everybody gets forgotten. I don't think Ricky was thinking about it. Ricky was, you know, that's not Ricky's way, but it was absolutely the way Pamela thought about it. And I, her attitude, you know, I said it to Ricky. I said, you know, Ricky, for people, to have seen you at your best when you were truly cranking. They had to be born no more than late 70s. I said, they're pushing 52, right? I said, they're almost 50 years old. So the people who actually can say they saw you, that number is not as high as we would like to think it was. <laughs> and Thanks. so, I, same, I'm 53. I'm thinking the same thing. And so, and, and, and so the stories that get remembered are not always the best stories the people who get remembered are not always the best people the the stories that get remembered are the ones that get repeated and that was what i was trying to appeal to him in cooperation i said ricky you want people to remember what you did and i said i'm sure what did i say to him i said i, I said you know there are two people in the seventh century that we've never heard of who were sitting there saying you know said at the time nobody's ever going to forget this and we have no idea what they're talking about Everything gets forgotten as time goes on. Yeah. I'll be remembered by letting somebody who respects your story tell the story instead of the other guys. So whatever. Good work on that, man. And here it's it is. You should get it from Green Lights. That's the book. Patrick's holding it. There's the link. Uh, we are off in August, um, but September, fingers crossed, I'm working on it. Our first ever live Squawk and Sports events. Two and a half years into yeah. the pandemic, which is gone. No, it's probably going to get wiped out by BA5. You know, we're going to push together and then it's going to get wiped out by <laughs> Who BA. knows what number it's going to be. We'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Uh, but yeah, that'll be great. It'll be nice to see Patrick in real life. I haven't seen him in person in like 10 months. So that'll be great. Uh, yeah, so this is great. Perfect uh, perfect author and subject. And I, I, even reading it made you miss that fun baseball. Like, I'm like, and you know, the Mets are actually kind of, Fun-ish for this kind sort of, of generation. Yeah. And, they've got, and they've got Buck, who's one of my favorites and one of the best guys to interview. He was fantastic. <laughs> also, the big Ricky fan was like, yeah, his version of my story is not anywhere near with <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> uh, I think Ricky's embellished on that one. Uh, take us out, please, Kay. Thank you, Howard. The book's Thank great. you guys so much. Thank, Thank you, you all so much for this great conversation. For everyone bearing with us through technology being technology and hey we won't have to worry about that when we are in person in september right in person wow uh howard congratulations on this new book it sounds fantastic i love that last bit we landed on of you know not every story is going to be remembered but when someone who respects your story is going to tell your story then we're we're going to hear the story that deserves to be told so thank you for sharing that with yeah, us my pleasure thank you yeah, and you can find the buy link and coupon code on our website as well as in our chat and many other books that Howard has written online as well. So thank you all so much for the conversation and have a great night. Great. Thank Go you. Go Mets. Yeah. See, you See you later. Thank you, Patrick.